Hello, I'm Jeremy Dobbert, Rockingham County Dairy Extension Agent. So you should have watched the video that Cynthia made uh, on getting calves off to a good start and raising calves up to and through breeding. We're going to talk about the rest of the story about getting started and raising dairy animals. Uh, mostly what I'm going to talk about is dairy cows because that's what I'm most familiar with, but many of these things uh, are true for both cows and goats. So preparing for production. So a, a cow or a goat must have a baby before they can start to produce milk. So the last 60 days of gestation or of their pregnancy, they should be in positive energy balance. And this is really important for the health of the cow and the calf. It'll get the calf off to a, a good birth weight and have the cow help her come into her milk and produce colostrum for the calf. Each animal will bag up differently, so we'll talk about some of the things that you might notice when they're getting ready to calve. Some of them will bag up over a few weeks, and some of them will bag up really quickly and then calve within a few days. And they can be different from lactation to lactation, so you'll just have to watch each animal and kind of know what is normal for them. So typically about 24 hours before calving is when they'll begin to produce milk. And the teeth will fill out, they'll start to be more uncomfortable, and their ligaments will begin to loosen, as we call the, we'll, around the, especially around the tail head. So about a week out, you can see this picture here of this cow. She was uh, eight days from calving in this picture. She's getting a little bit of swelling uh, here in her navel, uh, and she's getting some swelling in her udder, but not nothing too tight yet. She's not real uncomfortable yet. Uh, and that's kind of normal. Sometimes they'll get a lot of swelling uh, in their navel area. Sometimes they won't. Um, a lot of times first calf uh, animals will get more swelling uh, than older animals, but that's not always true. Their nutrition does have something to do with how much swelling they get. So their udder will start to get some edema. And you may need to feed them a little more energy so that they, can, so that they make enough colostrum. It's really important that they're getting enough energy this last week before they calve. So this is that same animal about 24 hours before she calved. You can see she's got a lot more swelling in her udder. Her teeth are starting to fill out a little bit. And when we talk about the ligaments loosening, it's really up here uh, in between the hips and what we call the pins. You'll start to see this sag a little bit. You know, there's some ligaments in there and they get real loose. Uh, because they're getting ready to stretch for the calf to come out. Sometimes they'll be dripping milk, sometimes they won't. Um, typically the appetite of them will decrease the closer they get to calving. But 24 hours out, they'll typically still have a pretty good appetite. It's usually only the last few hours where they're really uncomfortable and, and may lose their appetite a little bit. So keep them eating as, as much as normal and pos as possible before they calve. Um, so that they, they bag up and again, so that they produce the colostrum that the calf needs. So calving day is finally here. So make sure you have a clean and dry space to calve. Um, you can have a pen that's bedded, well bedded like this one here. Um, it can be out on a pasture if the weather's nice and there's some grass out there. Uh, cows are prey animals, so they're going to naturally try and hide in a corner, go away from their herd mates. Uh, sometimes they'll go to places where you wouldn't think it would be very comfortable or clean, but they're really just trying to hide the calf. So you really have to keep an eye on them and make sure that they're not trying to calve in a muddy area or wet area uh, so that the calf can come out in a nice, clean, and dry environment. It's really important for the health of the cow and the calf. So once the cow starts to calve, she'll uh, break her water. Typically, you'll see a bag uh, like a real thick bag come out first and it'll pop, but sometimes that water will pop before uh, it actually comes out. Um, either way, once that, uh, once she breaks her water, you'll see feet like here in this picture. This is a normal positioning a calf. There should be two of them um, and the dew claws should be on the bottom side or towards the bottom feet of the cow. Uh, if they're the other way, then the calf is either upside down or backwards. So, but this is a pretty normal positioning right here. So there's several different abnormal 
uh, calving positions uh, that might need intervention, and we'll show you those on this page here. So again, here in the top left corner, we have a normal calving position. So they're going to be coming out the front feet first, two claws down, and then the nose and the head. And typically, once the head comes out, the rest of the calf comes out pretty quickly. The rest of these are all different uh, positions uh, for the calves. The most common would be the calves just completely backwards, like this second one here. So, when you'll, and the first thing you'll notice is there'll be two feet and the dew claws on the back of the legs will be facing up instead of down. So you can get a live calf out this way, but it's important if you see this to, to be there to help this calf come out quickly. Because once the hips on this calf come out, that calf's going to try and take a breath pretty quickly. So you want to, so it's really important to get that calf out quickly. When it's coming out forward, it's a little less critical to get it out quickly because, again, the nose is coming out first. So when it wants to take a breath, if it's halfway out, it's not a problem. But if it wants to take a breath when it's halfway out backwards, it becomes a problem pretty quickly. In all these other positions, uh, if you're not familiar with, um, with pulling calves, you may want to have a, a vet uh, come out and work with these. Um, the other thing that could be abnormal in calving is what we call a twisted uterus or a uterine torsion. And that's where this whole uterus here actually twists and cuts this opening off completely. Um, sometimes they're easy to untwist and sometimes they're not. Uh, it happens a little more often in older animals than younger animals. Um, but that's another thing uh, to look for. In that case, you will not see any part of the calf coming out because, again, this will be twisted off and nothing can come through until that untwists. Uh, if you get in a situation like that, we recommend calling a veterinarian um, to help um, get, the, get the cow's uterus twisted back into a normal position and pull the calf out. So once the cow's water breaks, uh, the calf should be coming out or pretty close to coming out within an hour. Um, younger first time moms will take a little bit longer uh, sometimes, um, but not always. So make sure the calf is breathing. It's really important that the calf is breathing. Um, so, and you'll be able to see it. They'll start to move, um, make sure the calf's alive. The cow may get up right away and start licking on this calf. As you can see, there's two pictures that I have here of two different animals that calved, one out in the pasture and one in a nice, clean, dry pen. Um, and those cows got up pretty quickly after they calved and started licking on the calf. That's normal behavior. Uh, the calf will start to sit up. It may start to flop around a little bit. Um, and the cow will just kind of be licking it off to get it cleaned up. If the cow doesn't want to get up, um, for whatever reason, maybe she's just exhausted, um, maybe she's got a little a low calcium in her blood, uh, whatever the reason is, you can, if you're there, you can pull the calf around to the front of the cow and let her lick on it while she's laying down. Typically within an hour, the calf will start uh, attempt to stand. Sometimes they get up pretty quickly, sometimes they just kind of flop around a bunch. Um, but the calves can typically start uh, walking pretty quickly. Make sure to have fresh, warm water available for cows to drink after they calve. Remember, they've just gone through a stressful period. They probably haven't eaten or drinking um, for several hours. Uh, they've lost a lot of fluids having these calves, and they get really thirsty. So we try to have at least two five-gallon buckets uh, full of warm water. Uh, and most cows will drink that pretty quickly, uh, and we'll just we'll feed them as much as they'll drink. Uh, it doesn't need to be anything special, just nice, warm, fresh water. Um, most most animals are dom domesticated or are pretty calm, but they're some are more maternal than others. So don't get between the cow and the calf. So if you're going to be working there, you know, get outside of the calf. You can do stuff with the calf if you need to tag it or or just help it with something. But just don't get between the cow and the calf because that could be very dangerous. So it's collect the colostrum. So and Cynthia talked about in her video feeding the calf colostrum. So we're not going to go into actually feeding the calf, but just a little bit about getting that first milk out of the cow. So clean, clean, clean. It's really important to have clean colostrum for these calves. These calves don't have any immunity when they're born, so they got they um, rely on passive immunity coming through the colostrum. So if you get dirt in there, 
that's what's going to be the first thing that's going to try to get in their system, and they can get really sick really quickly. So if the udder is hairy, clip the hair off, clean the teats, make sure equipment is clean, wear nitro gloves um, when you're working. It's also important to feed or cool the milk or the colostrum quickly. So either feed it right away or cool it right away. Bacteria at room temperature in milk doubles every 20 minutes. So there's always some bacteria, um, but there can be a high bacteria load uh, in these animals sometimes. So it's really important to either get that milk in the in the calf really quickly um, or get it cooled so that the bacteria can't grow anymore. So next you're going to want to monitor the cow for the next few days. Uh, just she should, once she calves, uh, you've given her some water, um, look for the afterbirth to come out. And that can usually comes out a few hours after she calves. Um, but it could be up to 12, 14 hours after she calves, uh, that the afterbirth, uh, gets expelled. It is fairly common in dairy cows, uh, to retain the afterbirth, in which case they may need antibiotics or just really, uh, close care because uh, they could get an infection from that. So it's a little bit higher of a percentage than you see in other animals. Um, so it's a normal, not it's an abnormal thing, but not an uncommon thing for dairy cows to retain their placenta. So watch that they uh, release it all. Uh, when you're milking them, they're going to release oxytocin to let the milk down, and this is also going to make them try to push their afterbirth out. So if they haven't done that, they're going they might just... Uh, start pushing a little bit, and that again is pretty normal. So monitor their appetite. They should be hungry. They should start to eat um, pretty well. Uh, monitor monitor their temperature. Normal is 101.5 degrees. Uh, monitor their demeanor. Um, do they look normal? Are their ears droopy? Are their ears cold? Are their eyes watering? Um, just make sure they look normal and alert, and they're eating. Check the milk for mastitis. You can see here I have a strip cup. Um, you should, uh, everybody should have something similar to this or a way that they can check for chunks in the milk uh, to make sure that it's good. Uh, and again, this is just a little screen. You strip, strip the milk into it, and if there's chunks in there, it'll get caught on the screen, and it's real easy to see. So watch for uterine infections, and this can happen whether or not they have a retained placenta or not. Uh, some dirt can get in there and they can get an infection. So uh, they're just going to be draining a lot of discharge for a few weeks. Um, it should not have a smell to it, um, and it should typically be thick. Uh, it could vary in color. Uh, it could be clear to red to possibly brown or maybe even white, but it should be thick at all times, and it should not have a smell to it. So if they're draining um, stuff from their uterus that's that's real thin or, or smells really bad like an infection, uh, they may need uh, anti-inflammatories or antibiotics. And again, check with your veterinarian on what's best for your animal. So and watch for milk fever. Uh, milk fever is something that is more common in older cows and it's more common in certain breeds like jerseys uh, are, are more common. And what happens here is when these cows start to make milk, uh, they start to pull calcium uh, from their system to make milk uh, pretty quickly, and they can get calcium deficient. And their ears will be cold, uh, they could be clammy, uh, and they will have a difficult time standing up. So if you see this, um, if, you're, if you're trained, uh, you can administer calcium to the cow. If not, call a veterinarian to administer calcium for the cow. Uh, it's pretty treatable. Uh, they have they respond really quickly, but it's important to treat them as soon as possible if they have this um, disease. So a little bit about the lactation curve. So typically milk production will increase to about 60 days in milk. Uh, and then after that, they typically decrease, not decrease, decrease about 5% per month after that. <clears throat> So they're going to go up for 60 days. Their peak production, the most milk that we make is around 60 days after they calve. So also about the 60 days uh, postpartum, the cow is about ready to breed um, if you want to breed her back again. So that 60 day mark is kind of uh, at that point in time, she should, she should not be draining any 
any off-color substances or discharges uh, from her uterus. Uh, she should be milking. She should be kind of doing everything she needs to do, uh, just kind of chugging along. So just some pictures here, um, uh, some cows and a little, you know, this is some stalls uh, that we have here in our garage where we milk. Uh, the one on the left is a heifer that's just fresh um, two days. So you can see she's got a lot of swelling. Uh, the one on the right, the red and white cow, uh, has a little bit less swelling. She's fresh a, a few weeks there. So if you're going to be or who somebody's going to be consuming the milk raw, um, we recommend that the cow is tested annually for uh, these viruses, uh, tuberculosis and brucellosis, um, which is kind of the two big reasons that pasteurization was developed. Um, and I would test these cows annually for this. Um, bovine viral diarrhea, BVD, um, you can test once in a lifetime if they're BVD PI carriers. Um, paratuberculosis or yonis uh, is a... Uh, is a disease that's similar to Crohn's in people. Uh, and bovine leukosis virus, um, which is a virus that's very common uh, in dairy cows. Um, so I would test for all these, and there's some, some human health concerns with all these uh, in raw milk. If you're pasteurizing the milk, um, you, sh you should be good. It would be good to test the cows just to know whether you have these viruses, and all of these are uh, incurable um, diseases uh, if they are positive. So uh, the the Department of Agricultural Labs can test for all of these. Um, and it's not too terrible expensive. Um, again, the BVD you can just test once in a lifetime. Uh, the other ones I would test um, probably once a year. And um, some of these uh, like Yoni's or uh, the leukosis virus, if we have an animal on our farm that has that, we won't even feed that milk to calves. Um, so much less uh, allow any humans to consume it. Um, just because we don't want those calves. Um, there's a lot of studies that show that calves fed this milk uh, have a high, high risk of, of carrying the disease. So if you're interested in A2 proteins, that's a genetic test. Um, and again, they, they either are or they aren't. Um, and there's several labs around the country uh, that can test for that A2 protein. Um, colored breeds, Jerseys and Brown Swiss and Guernseys have a little bit higher percentage in the breed, um, but all breeds have A1 milk and A2 milk. Uh, if you're not sensitive to the A2 or to the A1 protein, um, it probably doesn't make much difference. Um, I know I've I've had A1 milk and A2 milk, and it doesn't. I really didn't see any difference in uh, in how my body reacts to it. So, uh, but I do know some people are sensitive to it. So, but that is a genetic test that you can test the animal for. So, milk collection. There's a lot of different ways. Uh, if you're going to be milking by hand or a vacuum pump and a bucket milker, um, we can go. We could probably talk for days about some of this stuff. Um, so, if you're interested in some of this information, you know, reach out to to Cynthia or I or your local extension agent, and we can get you more information. But clean, 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 clean is really important. Again, bacteria and milk double every 20 minutes at room temperature. So, um, the cleaner it is to start, uh, the better it is. Um, it, it's really difficult to, if you're milking by hand to have clean, uh, wear nitrile, to be clean, uh, wear nitrile gloves. Um, you know, everybody that's touching the cow's teats or, or milk surfaces should be wearing nitrile gloves. Um, they should be clean. Um, sanitize the teats. Um, typically, teat dips um, are um, either iodine or chlorhexidine based uh, teat dips, uh, and they'll have some, not only the to kill the bacteria, but they'll have some some sanitizers and some emollients for the skin. Uh, use a single-use towel, either paper paper towel or a cloth towel. Uh, you can uh, you know use cloth towels and wash them, um, but only use one per cow. And then you know when you have enough to to wash, that's fine. Um, that's what we use on our farm is the single-use uh, cloth towels because we can can wash them and reuse them. Um, or paper towels, um, they work just fine as well, but I always use one per cow. And if the cow is really dirty, you may need more, uh, more than one. 
Uh, it's important to post dip uh, the cows after they've milked because that sphincter muscle and their teat end is open um, for a little while. So that uh, disinfectant kills the bacteria on the teat. It protects bacteria from getting in there until that sphincter muscle closes. Uh, and use skin conditioners, uh, a teat dip that has skin conditioners in it, uh, especially in colder months. You know, just like your hands can get chapped, cows' teeth can get chapped. So just watch for that. Uh, the skin on the teeth should be smooth. They should not have cracks uh, in them. So cooling the milk. Uh, if it's going to be fed to calves, um, you know, we feed it right away. Uh, if not, uh, it should be cooled to less than 45 degrees within one hour. And the storage uh, should be at less than 40 degrees. And remember, bacteria doubles every 20 minutes at room temperature. It's good bacteria, bad bacteria, they all... They all double pretty quickly. So it's really important to get that milk cool as fast as you can. Uh, most regular refrigerators cannot cool uh, milk fast enough. Um, so if you have a commercial cooling or a bulk tank or some way that cools it uh, quickly is pretty important. Um, refrigerators are really good at keeping milk cold, but not really good at getting it cool fast. So if you're going to consume it um, for yourself, and again, in Virginia, it's still technically not legal to, to sell raw milk, um, but you can consume it yourself. Uh, just some things here. Um, on This is what we use on our farm. Uh, one of these uh, little two-gallon pasteurizers here on the left. Um, so we can pasteurize a few gallons of milk at a time. Um, we do that. We'll bring fresh milk in. Uh, we'll pasteurize it. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes, so it's not not too bad. We can just do it on the countertop. Um, here's a cream separator on the right um, to make butter, um, and then we'll feed that skim milk um, back to calves, typically, uh, and we'll make some butter. Um, these are not uh, not machines that are uh, you're able to to get certified to sell stuff with, but they're very good for home use. Um, this type of cream separator, I think works really good. There's a lot of plastic parts, um, um, but it's, uh, relatively easy to clean the older, uh, you maybe find some old deal of valve one cream separators, big metal ones. Uh, they work fine, but they are a lot of work to clean. There's some products you can make yogurt, kefir, cheese, butter. There's lots of different cheeses. Um, we like to make a lot of fresh cheeses just because uh, we, me and my wife, both work uh, full time and we don't have a lot of time. So we do stuff that we can make pretty quickly. Again, butter. Um, if you don't have a separator, you can let milk sit in a refrigerator um, for a day or two and the cream will separate and then you can just spoon it off the top. Um, and we just make the butter in a, um, in a KitchenAid mixer. Um, works pretty good. Uh, yogurt and kefir, um, you need cultures. Um, most cheeses, you need rennet, rennet and or cultures. Um, but there are some fresh cheeses that you can make um, without that. So uh, I was going through some of my pictures here. You can see this picture on the right. Kind of kind of made me happy. That was last May. And uh, I'm kind of getting tired of uh, winter, so, uh, and May doesn't seem quite that far away, so I'm hoping that uh, one day uh, we'll, we'll have our have grass like that again, uh, not this gloomy weather we've been having. So, but those are, those are some of our cows uh, there in our little pasture um, that we have. So you can decide when you want to breed them back to, to calf or to kid again. So the gestation for cows is nine months and for goats is five months. So um, cows can milk uh, for six months to three years, depending on the breed and the management and a lot of different things and how much milk you really want to get. Um, so if they're uh, like a, a shorthorn type of breed or they've got some beef influence there, they may only milk for six or seven months and then they'll kind of just dry up. Uh, I know brown Swiss are, are a very persistent breed and they'll, there's farms that milk those cows for, for three, three plus years, and they can still make a good amount of milk that long. So, uh, you need to decide what you want to do for your op, for your farm, 
um, how often you want to have a calf, you want to have a consistent milk supply, if you have one or two or three or four animals. Um, but they should be ready to breed back at about 60 days, which would get them calved to calve back again around the same time the next year or even a little sooner. Um, but that's a management decision, you know, decide if you want to, what time of the year you want to calve them. Um, you know, do you want to calve every other year? And again, that depends a little bit on the cow, whether they're capable of milking that long. Uh, they do have to have a calf um, for about at least 45 days. Uh, they should be what we call a dry period where they're not milked um, before they calve again. And this will just help their, their udder to kind of, you know, sort of have a break as uh, so their vacation. Uh, decide if you want to breed artificial or natural service. We typically re recommend artificial just because bulls can be really mean and really dangerous. Um, and we don't like to see people getting hurt. Um, decide if you're going to breed for beef or dairy replacements. Um, you can breed a dairy cow to a beef bull and then have a calf that you can raise for, uh, for beef. Um, or if you want a dairy replacement, um, you know, raise that calf. So, um, so the average cow is going to live four to six years. Uh, they can live 12 to 15 years, um, and be productive. Um, sometimes, you know, two to three years are, they're going to be something genetically wrong with them. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell. So, but I'd say typically on average four to six years is going to be a, a good way to plan. Um, we got our oldest cow is almost 12 years old right now, so they can definitely live, live for a long time. So and that's all I have for the presentation. I know that's just a, a very, very brief overview. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you got more questions, you can reach out to me or Cynthia or your local extension agent. And um, like I said, we can, we could probably talk about this all day.